friendship that'll never ever end. Run! a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction being the yo 566. Day in the neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. The man that we're about to go back to today is a man that we all know and love. And that man is Ryan from Tragedy Tales. Back to Tragedy Tales, y'all. And the title of the video is Lori Bulldozer for Christmas Tragedies. Now, just the thought, man, just the thought being team of something happening that's tragic to you on Christmas is effed up. Long story, short story, long. That ish is effed up. And I don't know where we're about to go in this video, but I'm ready to freaking go. But. Before we go, my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to Ryan from Tragedy Tales. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's go. Christmas has to be one of the best times of the year. The cold weather and the catchy tunes, paired with loads of gravy and the smell of cinnamon, it's just a right vibe, isn't it? But sadly, as you all know on this channel, tragedy can strike when you're driving down the street, when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, or perhaps the night before Christmas. Mm. I'm Ryan here from Tragedy Tales, and this week, we're gonna take a look at five tragedies that unfolded on the run-up to Christmas. A brutal reminder to hold your loved ones close and to appreciate them, because you never know when it's all going to end. This week, we're taking a look at the tragic Berlin Christmas market attack to the terrifying hijacking of Air France Flight 8969. Mm. So, without any messing about, go grab yourself a nice hot drink and draw the curtains. Let's get right into it. Get whatever you may need. Number five. This entry begins in December of 2022, in a city called St. Helier, capital of Jersey, a small island located just off the coast of France. The holiday spirit was in full swing. Streets twinkled with the Christmas lights and the air was filled with the anticipation of the upcoming celebrations. Families were preparing for the holidays, eagerly anticipating the joys of the season. However, this Christmas would not be the same as the others the festive atmosphere would soon be shattered by an unexpected tragedy. Hmm. On the cold evening of December the 9th, residents in a block of flats on Pier Road, located in St. Helier, started to notice that something was deadly wrong. As the residents enjoyed their evening, they couldn't help but notice the smell of gas wafting through the building. This, of course, caused massive concern amongst them all prompting a call to the Jersey Fire Service. They quickly responded and investigated the situation, but after assessing the scene, they handed the matter over to Island Energy, the local electricity and gas operator, at around 9pm. 
Mm. Island Energy took a look at the flats, but they told residents not to worry, stating that there was no gas supply to the block of flats. This gave the residents a false sense of security. And yeah, like this don't even, I, we already starting all bad with this one, y'all. Because the fact that the police and then Island Energy, you know, the freaking gas people have came out and evaluated the situation and trying to tell everybody that, oh no, it's not a big deal. But you can't tell me it's, a, it's not a big deal if I'm literally freaking smelling gas. You know what I'm saying, man? Like I'm smelling the freaking fumes. This is a big deal. See, me personally, I probably would have had to leave for the night or whatever because I'm not going to trust what these motherfuckers telling me because they lying man they trying to tell me it's not a big deal when i'm literally smelling the big deal in the early hours of december the 10th at around 4 a.m as the residents were fast asleep in their beds all tucked up captured on cctv a devastating blast tore through the block of flats the explosion was so powerful that it could be heard all across jersey shattering the peace of the night The explosion's impact was so severe that it rattled windows and shook buildings. Some described it as feeling like they were in an earthquake. Shortly after the blast, the flat in which it occurred collapsed like a pancake, destroying it and burying the people inside. Damn, Residents man. like Daniel Hunt, a 19-year-old living across the bay, were awakened by the explosion. The intensity of the blast shook his bedroom. The explosion caused a fire which sent a plume of smoke billowing across the night sky. Emergency services arrived at the scene to tackle the blaze and they quickly extinguished it. This is when specialist resources were deployed to stabilize the scene and attempt to reach any possible survivors in the rubble. All throughout the night, they worked tirelessly to save those trapped. As dawn broke, the full extent of the catastrophe became evident. Hundreds of tons of debris lay scattered all across the road. A once joyful neighborhood was now the site of sorrow and loss. Throughout the 10th of December, the response to the disaster intensified. Specialist rescue teams from the UK joined the local emergency services in a joint effort to search for survivors and assist the victims. And I just got to point out real quick to y'all, the freaking, I don't know if it's the police department or the island energy people, somebody need to be sued like a mother for this. You know what I'm saying, man? Like some people need to be sued. Everybody in that building, and I know Ryan ain't said it yet, but let's just go and keep it real. A lot of these people probably have lost their lives, but at least their family need to be confiscated. Comp compensated you know what i'm saying and i'm not even saying that freaking money y'all know i don't believe that freaking money it, it can make up for a person losing their life but i'm just saying man these people need to be sued whether it's the police department or that um gas company or whatever these people need some type of something for this money don't bring back life but it's 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 worth it's worth it i don't even know what to say for that but i know y'all get what i'm saying these people are totally at fault for this at least one person has been killed in a suspected gas explosion at a block of flats in jersey in the channel islands around a dozen people are still missing the huge explosion was caught on cctv in the early hours of this morning and came after residents reported smelling gas last night that evening, the police confirmed the tragic loss of life and reported that several individuals were still missing. After sifting through the concrete, in total, a tragic nine people lost their lives in the blast, leaving three in serious condition in the hospital. 73-year-old Kathleen McGuinness, who was living in an adjacent building, was injured in the explosion and sadly died in hospital on Christmas Day. Damn. The owner of the flats, Andium Holmes, took immediate action to ensure that those who have lost their homes had a place to stay. But days after the incident, a formal investigation was then opened as to why this occurred. Residents and locals were fuming at the fact that they had reported the gas leak hours previously, but nothing was done and now 10 innocent people were dead. Police questioned Andium Homes and they said that there had been no mains gas supply at the block confirming that none of the residents were hooked up to gas supplies 
and that none of them were using gas at all. They then admitted to the fact that there was a redundant gas supply somewhere within the flats that was not cut off from the mains. The chief of police, Robin Smith, said that the site was now being treated as a crime scene. Mm. In 2023, three people were arrested for negligent manslaughter. However, as this is a live case, the investigation continues. Oh. The explosion at St. Helier, occurring at the cusp of the holiday season, is a brutally tragic incident that truly shouldn't have occurred. If Island Energy had done their job and investigated as they should, these people wouldn't have died and the whole incident could have been avoided. Yes. I hope that their families get some form of justice for this, but as I said, the case is still ongoing. Damn, man. And uh, just for y'all that don't know, Brian put this video out uh, like seven months ago. He actually put this out during Christmas. I was just having technical difficulties at that time, and I wasn't able to watch it and react to it when he actually put it out. And I don't know if the case still ongoing, but it's just like at the end when the case do get solved, and I hope it gets solved or come to a conclusion. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Whenever we come to a conclusion within this case, like I was saying earlier, man, I hope the these families do get some form of justice and i know man i don't be wanting and i know i keep harping on this too or talking about the money thing but you gotta give them something man like they deserve to get some millions of dollars and live the rest of their life without worrying about money at the very least man you didn't freaking cause their family members to die you gotta give them something so give them money so they can at least live comfortably because for the rest of their life that tragedy that happened to their family members will always be in their head and for that uh lady to die on christmas Freaking tragic, man. Just freaking tragic. Let's go to number three. We starting off hot. Number three. On Christmas Eve in 2009, the city of Toronto was bustling with the usual pre-Christmas excitement. In a quiet corner of the city, near Kipling Avenue and West Humber Boulevard, a group of workers from Metron Construction gathered at a high-rise apartment building, their breaths visible in the chilly air. That morning, they were there to carry out balcony restoration on the building's 13th floor, an unlucky number for some. Going high up in the air and carrying out work with just a harness between life and death was a routine task that had become part of their everyday life, so they didn't think much of it. Among them on the team were Fazilo Fazilov, Alexander Bondarevs, Vladimir Korostin, Alexei Blumberg, and Dilushod Maropov. As they climbed onto the swing stage scaffold, a suspended platform used for such high-rise work, they were likely thinking of the upcoming holiday and what they were going to do with their family. The scaffold, seemingly sturdy, stretched along the side of the building. It offered them access to the balconies that needed attention, with the city below them moving at its usual pace, it was just another day at work. As the morning progressed, the workers were focused on their tasks. However, unbeknownst to them, the scaffold in which they had entrusted their life was compromised. It had not been properly assembled and actually failed to meet the critical safety standards required for such equipment. This oversight, seemingly insignificant at the moment, was a ticking time bomb. As the clock neared noon, with the sun at its peak and the city engrossed in its daily hustle, completely without warning, the scaffold gave way. Oh. In a heart-stopping moment, the entire platform collapsed, plunging four of the men to their tragic deaths. Oh my God. Dilishan Malpov, though critically injured, actually survived the fall, while the sixth worker, the project manager, who was actually there that day, and should have been overseeing the safety of the team, Vadim Kazanelson only survived after he was able to grab a hold of a balcony as he fell. These guys were just doing their day jobs and it cost them their lives. 
they just doing what you do on a day-to-day -day basis at work. You know what I'm saying? They have went up on those scaffoldings and went up on them platforms a million times. And I'm being, I'm using, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Y'all know that. But what I'm saying is, man, they have done this many, many of times. And then just that one day, look at what happened, man. Look at that right there. Can you imagine those dudes falling to their death? And it's one thing to fall to your death, but to fall to your death with multiple people, you and your co-workers screaming at the same time knowing you about to die like it's just crazy to think about the aftermath of the collapse was chaotic and somber five workers fell 13 stories from a swing stage four were killed while another sustained life-changing injuries this incident shook the local community raising serious questions about workplace safety and of course the measures in place to protect workers during high-risk jobs. Attention then turned as to who was responsible. The project manager who was there that day and who was responsible for overseeing safety, Vadim, was later arrested and accused of four counts of criminal negligence causing death and one causing bodily harm. Mm. After the court found that he was in fact aware that protections were not in place should the scaffolding fall, he was later sentenced to three and a half years behind bars his appeal being unsuccessful. Wow. But the owner of the company, a man named Schwartz, was also sentenced to pay $90,000 for four charges of negligent homicide. The company and Schwartz were also ordered to pay a victim surcharge, totaling $52,000, bringing the total fines to $342,000 US dollars. But this incident was a pivotal point for safety across construction sites. The ministry increased fines for occupational health and safety breaches to the highest level in the country. They also introduced a law stating that business officers and directors who do not provide a safe environment that leads to a worker being injured or dying on the job could face fines of up to 1.5 million US dollars. The scaffolding collapse on that fateful day in 2009 remains etched in the memory of Toronto's residents. And, and I got to say this, man, it's so sad that people have to die like a tragedy have to happen before companies and just businesses as a whole can tighten up on their policies and tighten up on their fines, increase fines, like long store, short, short store, long, get on these mother, you know what's asses to make them uh be sharp in making sure that their employees are, 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 are safe in their work environments you know what i'm saying man like it's sad that those do had to lose their lives for these people to uh increase the fines and to make sure that y'all are making sure man that they are safe out there when they working man like it's like dude it it's like us as humans, man, when we do something over and over and over and over again, we get comfortable. Even if it's dangerous, we kind of like just naturally get comfortable doing it. But man, you always got to keep your eyes open wide and stay safe. You know what I'm saying, man? You got to always make sure that everything is okay before you do some of these dangerous things. Even though you done did it a million times and you feel like you can do it with your eyes closed, don't do it with your freaking eyes closed. Make sure they wide open and everything is all good and everything is safe long story short short story long rest in peace to them four man this has been good y'all let's go number two in the early hours of december the 15th 2010 christmas island a festive beacon located approximately 2,660 kilometers from the Australian mainland, was enveloped in a tragic accident that would forever mark its history. Christmas Island, known for its unique Yuletide spirit, was actually named on Christmas Day in 1643. In 2022, it had 1,692 residents, and every year, they go full festive mode. They deck the halls with lights, they sing carols, but that year, they were completely oblivious to the impending crisis. 
I just got to point out real quick, y'all, I have never heard of no freaking Christmas Island. And now that I have heard about it, I got to add it to my bucket list. But I, I don't know if I'm going to add it yet because I don't know what's finna, finna happen in this particular story. But I'm just saying, man, Christmas Island sounds like a place that one day I would love to visit. But let's see what the hell happened first. Christmas Island, while small, is characterized by jagged cliffs and treacherous shores presenting a formidable challenge for any seafaring vessel. However, these cliffs have not deterred the flow of refugees ever since the late 1980s, usually from Indonesia seeking asylum. But on that fateful December morning, as the islanders prepared for Christmas, a dire situation was unfolding off of their coast. Monsoon season had brought fierce winds and massive waves, severely hampering visibility. At approximately 5.20 a.m., during these horrible conditions, a boat was spotted struggling at sea. The boat was being battered by the waves and was emitting a large plume of black smoke from its engine. Emergency calls flooded in from both the island's residents and the boat's passengers. However, the passengers could not speak English, so first responders struggled to understand the seriousness of the issue when calls started being received. The mm. vessel, later identified as CF-221, was an overcrowded Indonesian fishing boat repurposed to transport 89 asylum seekers and three crew members from Iraq to Iran. Tragically, the passengers, cramped and ill-prepared for emergency situations, faced a dire predicament. Throughout the journey, the boat's engine had been failing, and on this journey, it completely gave out at around 10 past 6 a.m., leaving Dang. the vessel at the mercy of the storm and drifting perilously towards Rocky Point, a treacherous location on Christmas Island. There was nothing anyone could do to stop it. The winds brought the boat closer and closer towards Rocky Point, and here the boat was tragically thrust against the cliffs by the fierce waves. Oh... Oh my God. First. And we just got to keep in mind, y'all, that it's people on that freaking boat. Why, why they getting hit by them waves and stuff, man? Like, what do you do in that situation? Only thing I can think about doing is just getting down on my hand and knees and just covering my head. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, just going into a freaking fetal position or something. Or like we used to do when we was in freaking uh, school, especially elementary, when they had the, the tornado warnings and stuff. And you go in the hallway and you do like this. Like, that's the only thing I could think about doing in that situation that is elf though first impact it was fine the second impact it was okay and the third impact completely shattered the hull at oh. around 6 25 to 6 35 a.m the passengers many unable to swim and drenched in diesel were thrown into the choppy sea oh my fucking as the entire tragedy unfolded Around 60 island residents gathered atop the cliffs. Here, they desperately threw life jackets and ropes and tried to lift people out of the water, but their efforts were hampered by the extreme conditions. Australian custom vessels, HMS Paris and ACV Triton, scrambled to the scene, but they were on the east side of the island. They arrived at around 7 a.m. and here they were met with a harrowing scene. The boat had completely capsized. People were drifting lifeless in the water some clinging onto debris, some clinging onto life jackets, the smell of diesel strong in the air, they got to work. By 9 a.m., 41 survivors were pulled from the water, with the islanders assisting as spotters. However, 50 people were not so lucky. 35 adults and 15 children lost their lives, with only 30 bodies ever being recovered. The survivors post-rescue were placed into mandatory immigration detention centres on the island, with the orphans being moved to the Australian mainland. While the Indonesian crew members faced convictions for people smuggling, the captain, who had abandoned the boat earlier when things got rough, managed to escape justice. 
This incident led to a class action lawsuit in 2015 against the Australian government for alleged negligence. This was dismissed by the Supreme Court of New South Wales, saying that they tried their best and that they can't control the sea conditions. While that day may be over, the psychological impact on the Christmas Island community was profound, with many reporting symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. The things that people had to witness that day, they should have never had to. A public memorial at Smith Point featuring the damaged propeller of SIE-221, along with a memorial plaque, stands as a testament to this tragic incident, a sharp contrast to the island's otherwise festive atmosphere. Man, oh man, oh man, y'all. Did y'all see So I didn't want to stop it, but did y'all see some of the... Uh, I didn't want to stop it while we was watching that part of it. Y'all saw some of those images from how the boat was assembled with the people on it to after it had it pretty much exploded, got dismantled by crashing into the rocky rocks or whatever that was on... Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the name of it, but those rocks on... Um, Christmas Island. Did y'all see the images of the people in the freaking water, man? Oh my God. Then a lot of them lost their life. Then the, the other bullshit about that whole situation is the fact that the freaking captain, not only did he survive and was a, a big cause of this, he ain't even get charged with nobody murder. He free to this day. Still walking around being team. He walking around amongst us, man. That is crazy too. Jesus effing Christ, that is so sad. I, I know Ryan said 15 children, and I think he said like 20 or something uh, adults or 50 people in all. My God, man, that is crazy looking at that image of that freaking boat, man. Before and after. Before and after. Rest in peace to everybody who lost their life. Let's go to number one. Number one. As the evening of December 19th, 2016 unfolded in Berlin, the Christmas market at Breitscheid Platz was a picture of festive joy. Nestled within the city's heart, the market was always a bustling hub of activities, where locals and tourists alike congregated to soak in the holiday spirit. Surrounded by the historical aura of the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, the market was a blend of tradition and happy celebration. Families, friends and couples strolled among the wooden stalls. The air was filled with the sounds of Christmas carols, laughter and the gentle hum of conversations. The aroma of roasted chestnuts, gingerbread and mulled wine added to the magical atmosphere, almost warming the chilly winter air. The Breitscheid Platz market is something that I've always wanted to visit. And one day, hopefully, I will. But that night, children's faces lit up with excitement, darting between the stalls, marvelling at the handcrafted toys and sweets. Everyone was having the time of their lives. Until the clock neared 8pm. The market was at its peak, alive with the vibrant energy of a community united in celebration, People were huddled together, laughing, making memories to last a lifetime. But suddenly, this scene of communal joy was violently disrupted. Without a second's warning, a large black Scania R450 semi-truck trailer veered off the road, barreling at high speed into the crowded market. Mmm. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Before anyone had any idea what was going on, before anyone could take in what was happening, the truck smashed into the wooden stalls with brutal force, its heavy frame bulldozing through the structures as if they were nothing. The market, moments ago filled with sounds of festivities, was now plunged into a cacophony of screams, crashing wood, and the screeching halt of the truck. People scrambled in panic, trying to escape the path of the rampaging vehicle. But the truck was like a juggernaut. It continued on its destructive path. Stalls that had been adorned with Christmas lights and decorations 
were now crushed under the truck's weight, their contents spilling out into the ground, crushing people who were inside. In all the Damn, man, I'm just wondering, is this an accident or whoever in this truck did this on purpose? That's the main thing I'm running, wondering right now, Bean Team. Chaos. The truck eventually came to a stop after plowing through the market for around 50 meters or around 160 feet. It left a trail of destruction, injury, and death. As people tried to comprehend what had just occurred, a figure was seen leaping out of the truck, fleeing the scene towards the darkness of Tiergarten, disappearing into the night. I guess it ain't no goddamn accident because whoever was driving jumped out the truck and tried to run away. Well, did run a freaking way. He did this shit on purpose or she, you know what I'm saying, man? Are you kidding me? Whoever, if they, if they did this on purpose, then God, please, please, please let them be caught and let them go to prison for the rest of their life. Please don't leave us with no unsolved mystery, Ryan. Come on, man. What the freak? Initially, some thought that the driver might have suffered some sort of medical emergency. However, the deliberate vehicle movements and the driver's subsequent escape sparked fears of a darker motive. The grim reality soon became apparent. Inside the truck lay the original driver, Lucas Urban. He had been stabbed and shot multiple times. He was dead. This was no accident, but a calculated deadly attack. Oh my God, that adds so many different more layers to it, y'all. So the, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't even the original freaking truck driver. He got attacked by a crazy motherfucker off the streets or whoever. You know what I'm saying? Took over his truck and then did this craziness. Wow, that just add more to the freaking craziness. Investigations revealed the chilling details. Lucas Urban was a Polish driver who had been en route to Poland from Italy. He was eager to join his family home for Christmas, but tragically, he would never get to spend it with them. Tragically, his journey ended in Berlin, when an unknown assailant hijacked his truck, committing an act of terror. Early reports, heroically but inaccurately, suggested that Lucas attempted to thwart the attack. However, it was later found that the truck was only halted because of its automatic braking system. The mm. German Chancellor and Minister swiftly labeled the attack as terrorism. There is much we still don't know with sufficient certainty, but we must, as things stand now, assume it was a terrorist attack. A truck has rammed into a Christmas market in Berlin, Germany this evening. At least nine people have been killed. There are many injured. The crash is eerily similar to the deadly terrorist attack in Nice, France last July. By the end of the ordeal, 12 people had died, leaving 56 with serious life-changing injuries. Victims were injured not only by the truck slamming into them, but also the impact of the collapsing wooden stalls that collapsed around them. This was the deadliest terror attack in Germany since Oktoberfest in Munich in 1980. This incident left Germany and the world in complete shock. People were furious that this was allowed to happen, but then the attention shifted dramatically to identifying and capturing the person who was responsible. Yes, On the evening of December the 19th, 2016, the police arrested a man who was believed to have been driving the truck. But after checking him, he had no injuries and no gunshot residue on him. He was not involved and so he was later released, meaning the true culprit was still at large. A few days later, on December the 21st, the police announced that they had made a chilling discovery, a discovery that would break the case wide open. Underneath the seat of the wrecked truck, they found a suspension of deportation permit. This permit was a critical piece of evidence, inadvertently left behind by the attacker in his haste to flee. It bore the name Anis Amri, a 24-year-old Tunisian national. Not only did it provide a name to the faceless assailant, but it also indicated a failure in the system that allowed Amri, who was on a watch list and actually earmarked for deportation, to remain in the country 
and execute such a catastrophic attack. Investigators quickly pieced together Amri's profile. Amri had managed to evade close surveillance by officials by using multiple identities and exploiting gaps in the immigration and security systems. Finding out the name of this man only fueled the manhunt. After the attack on the Christmas market, a CCTV camera captured Amri leaving the scene at a nearby railway station. After this CCTV footage, he hopped on the train and left Germany, traveling through the Netherlands to Belgium and to France before eventually reaching Italy. This surveillance footage only infuriated the police. In the coming days, the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant claimed responsibility for the attack. They released a video featuring Amri himself pledging allegiance to the terror group's leader. It was around this time that German authorities offered a reward for up to 100,000 euros for information leading to Amri's arrest. They were really worried that he was going to slip through the net and escape justice. Amri was officially Europe's most wanted man and officials warned that he might be armed and dangerous. Lord, please let them catch this man. European law enforcement agencies coordinated across borders, racing against time to capture him before he could strike again. But back in Berlin, the damage of the attack was deep and raw. The festive spirit of the market was irrevocably tainted. These Christmas market killings are the most violent attack to take place in this country this year. As with earlier incidents, this has prompted expressions of condolence and solidarity across Germany and the scene of the crime was transformed. Normally, this square would be thronging with people bustling around the shopping and enjoying the festive season. But now, after the attack, it's become a shrine to those who lost their lives and were injured in the incident. And the question on everyone's lips, is Germany safe? Where there had once been joy and celebration, there was now loss and death and a palpable sense of vulnerability. Families of the victims and the injured grappled with their loss and trauma. The city, once known for its resilience and vibrant culture, found itself united in grief and shock. Amri's run came to an end in Italy, four days after the attack. He was in a Milan suburb, and during a police routine check, they asked him for identification, to which, of course, he had none. Amri drew a gun and shot one of the police officers in the shoulder. This prompted the police to fire at him, shooting him dead. At first, they had no idea who they'd killed. It was only when they checked the fingerprints that they realized that the person that they'd shot was in fact Amri, the man responsible for the deadly attack. He'd finally been served his justice. They also later confirmed that the gun he had shot the police officer with was in fact the same gun used to shoot Lucas and hijack the lorry. Despite the assailant being killed, this provided little closure to family members whose loved ones' lives were cut tragically short. And yeah, that's what I was about to say too, man. Despite, even though he got killed too by the police, but it really don't, I don't feel no justice. Like, I, it don't make me feel no better about what he did, man. Like, oh, this is so, elf, man, gee. Soon after the attack, a petition to award Lucas Urban, the original truck driver, gathered over 2,500 signatures. Along with this, a GoFundMe page was set up by British truck driver Dave Duncan, raising £190,000 to support his family. In response to the attack, Germany went on to ban the Salafist Mosque Organisation, a German Muslim community involved in preparing members for terrorism. But while Amri was dead, the attack left a lasting impact on the Christmas market in Berlin as a whole. In preparation for the Christmas market in 2018, Breacherplatz market and its surroundings were fortified against potential terrorist attacks, a physical reminder of the threat that had once turned this place of celebration into a scene of true horror. On the fourth anniversary of the attack, In December of 2020, a ceremony was held at the Breachplatz Market, attended by the survivors and relatives of the victims. The Archbishop of Berlin, Heiner Koch, acknowledged that Berlin was not the same as before. 
yeah. underscoring the lasting impact of the tragic event on the city's collective memory. Nearly five years after the attack, in 2021, a man who was critically injured during the horrific night's attack succumbed to complications related to a head injury that he had sustained while trying to help people leave the stalls, officially Dang. becoming the 13th victim. The Berlin Christmas Market continues to operate each year up to this very day, a symbol of defiance against the terror that had sought to silence its spirit. However, the memory of that tragic night will forever linger, a permanent scar on the heart of the city. Each and every time those market stalls go up, the horror of this event opens again. It continues to reverberate, and I expect it will do for the foreseeable future. May the people featured in this attack and this video rest in peace. Rest in peace. But that is the end of the video. Wow. So where do I start with this one? So first of all, the gas explosion. The residents knew that the gas was in there, they could smell it, but nothing was done, leading to the deaths of innocents. I really hope they get justice. And I've said this in other videos, life gave them a red flag and the officials chose to ignore it. Rather than evacuate the people, they let them go up to their bedrooms and go to sleep, and they tragically died. Then we've got the Air France Flight 896, but still three people were lost and people who were on that plane, they will never ever forget that day. The scaffolding collapse should have never ever happened. Even in 2009, there had been a litany of accidents with scaffolding, but this company didn't bother, they didn't care, and it led to people dying on Christmas Eve. Of course, the Christmas Island boat shocked me to my core. That footage was just horrifying to look at. And the Berlin attack. I am lost for words. Surely someone should have seen this coming. But then people are crazy. You can't predict crazy. I wish Amri would have been brought to court and tried for his crimes. Because now the families have no one to look at, no one to blame for their loss. But most importantly, what do you think? What do you think of this one? It's kind of sad to think that uh, anything can go wrong around Christmas. So I hope no tragedies occur for you guys. And while I'm here, I just wanted to thank all you guys who have watched these videos over this year. Your support has meant the world to me. And I couldn't thank you enough. Here's to many more videos in the next year. But I will see you in 2024. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye. Man, oh man, oh man, Bean Team. I'm so glad that we came back and watched this one from Ryan, y'all, because like I said earlier, man, I was having technical difficulties during the actual time that he put this out around Christmas time. You know what I'm saying? And like he said, and I'll say it again, man, rest in peace to all those people and all these different uh, videos or um, stories or whatever may have you that they lost their lives, man. And we're going to run, we're going to run through them real quick, real quick, y'all. And we're going to start from the most recent one that we just watched he said it ryan said it man like you can't predict a stupid motherfucker doing some stupid shit long story short short story long man you can't predict nobody getting into a 18 wheeler and crashing into in a, a, a plaza or a freaking space within a, a, a where a lot of people are walking within man and just starting to run over people like you can't expect that man it is just sad that it happened to those people man and I, i'm i'm glad that they found out who it was i'm glad that he actually got caught but it's like he really didn't face no consequences unless we unless we just this one that's one of those stories where we got to say god gonna handle it you know what I'm saying, man? Because he did before he even went to trial or anything. So no justice was served on earth. But I believe 
And when I really think about it, because I believe in some type of afterlife, believe in God and all that. So I believe that he going to face some consequences. Might not have been here on earth, but I believe in afterlife. He will face something. Just my beliefs on that. Um, What was the one before that, y'all? All these was freaking crazy, man. The, uh, um, no, it's not that one. That's the same one. Hold on, hold on. Let me get right, y'all. Let me find it. I'm scrolling back through now, man, because I want to. I want to make sure that I talk about all of them. The boat. The boat seeing the footage of the freaking boat, man. And it just crashing into and all those people that was on that boat. That boat already looked rinky dink than the mother already, man. Then all those people being on it. And just the footage that we were seeing or how those waves was hitting it. The, the, the before and after of the boat. Rest in peace to all those. And then a lot of them was children too, y'all, man. Rest in peace to them. And the fact that the freaking captain didn't even face no consequences is just like, oh, my God, man. Like, really? Freaking Christmas Island. The one before that, the people on the scaffolding doing their job, they regular 9 to 5, going to their 9 to 5 like they have done a million times before, and then something like that end up happening to them. And it, 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 it really goes back to, because even me, y'all, like the job that I do, I work with freaking Fort Lifts and Pallet Jacks and all that, man. And you can get comfortable and i've been doing it for almost freaking damn 15 years now you know what i'm saying you can get comfortable doing that type of work even though you like a freaking pallet jack and a forklift that is dangerous if you're not being careful with it so i try to remind myself all the time that i'm dealing with some heavy machinery right now that if i make the wrong move something bad can happen and i'm not gonna even say those people made the wrong move it was the person who should have been making sure everything was safe for them that made the wrong move man he got too complacent or whatever i'm not gonna make no excuse for him long story short story long on that with my brothers and sisters make sure whatever you're doing in life that you always safe make sure the safety is always a part of whatever you are doing um the first one the freaking boat man not the boat the um the hotel slash not hotel apartment complex whatever the freak you want to call it all those people telling the police telling of uh, the energy island energy i think it was we smell gas and then them just dismissing it like this is not a problem and then it end up blowing up literally in everybody's face and some of these people lost their life. Like, I'm pissed off at that one, man, because they dropped the ball, man. They could have present, they could have prevented that damn shit from happening, man. So, and that's the ongoing case, too. That's the ongoing case. We don't even got no freaking conclusion to that one. All I'm gonna say on that one is long story short, short story long. I hope those family victims and uh, family members victims and everybody that's within that case that should get some type of justice get some type of justice any way that they can but i digress i'm gonna let y'all go now man we have been here long enough this was a great one to come back to ryan to check out i appreciate y'all coming on back as always and before y'all leave just please 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 hit that like button comment subscribe and do all that if you ain't did that yet and come on back to Mr. Uh, Balling tomorrow on a Sunday. But until then, my friends, I also need y'all to remember this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.